I'd like to greet you and welcome you to a very fascinating group of studies. They are the great covenants of God. I love covenants. I love agreements. They are understandings. If I, if I say to a young woman named Louise, I'm going to live with you the rest of my life, we make a covenant together. And I say, I will live with you as the husband of the family and as the head of the house. And I will promise you to make you a living. And I'll promise to protect you to the best of my ability. We've entered into a covenant relationship. And as long as we live, we should live under that covenant. But that's, that's a human covenant. God started all the covenant business. He believes in covenants. And, and so we, uh, uh, we learn covenants from God. We learn agreements from God. And it's so amazing to me that the one who made the entire universe was willing to enter into agreements with a man that he made. I think that is very fascinating. In Genesis chapter 17 and verse 7, God says, I will establish. You know what establish means? I will establish my covenant between me and thee. God says, I'll put the thing in focus. I'll put it in strength. I'll, I'll establish it. And between thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God. A God is a God, you know, not a man. To be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. So God very deliberately says, I want to make a covenant between you and your children after you. I believe God has a covenant with the United States of America. And I believe if we ever break the covenants of our Constitution, that down we go. We're seeking hard to wrench ourselves free from the covenants of God especially in relation to religion in the state. If we ever break the covenant, there'll be no other relationship where God has any promises to bless this nation. We better hope the, co the covenant stands. But God does want to make covenants. And I was explaining to you in our last lesson that there are, there are symbols of covenant that God creates and brings into being. And a remarkable example of that it's what we all see with our natural eyes, and that's the rainbow. The rainbow is not just a phenomenon sticking in the sky that's something pretty to look at and say, oh, what a pretty rainbow, and at the bottom of the rainbow is a pot of gold. No, there's nothing there at all. There's nothing there but sunshine and rain, and you're seeing the glittering, beautiful elements there that God has placed there to say, here is my promise, here is my covenant with man that I will never destroy this earth by water. Also, in Abraham's covenant that we will be studying, uh, God related his covenant to not something you see with the eye, but that you feel that all the males would be, circum that, that would be uh, circumcised. So circumcision became the, the, the seeing part, the feeling part, the natural part, that, that the nation of Israel would be a circumcised nation uh, to set them apart from other human beings. And, and they would understand their covenant with God through a physical thing. Uh, you say, well, why wasn't it some, some spiritual thing? It is so easy for man to forget. It is so easy. When I was in Peking, North China, it may be gone since the communists are there, but when I was in Peking, North China, at the British embassy, there was a stone wall and as you would ride by in your rickshaw or on a bus, you would see written on that stone wall in large letters in English, lest we forget. The Chinese government asked the British to take those ugly words off that wall. And at that time, the British said, no, we're not removing those words. Said the last missionaries were hiding behind the wall when the boxers were closing in to, to kill them. The Empress of China, the Dowager Queen, was determined to liquidate all the foreigners in the land. And they were 
trembling and hiding there from the shot when the Marines came and saved them and said, we don't want to forget that. We want to remember that we were right at death and we were saved and we want to remember it. You and I need some little lest we forgets. Maybe you should tack them up on your bedroom wall and wake up in the morning and say, lest I forget my covenants with God. Uh, God with the people of Israel said, I am making a covenant with you. I am sealing it and I am signing it with the law of circumcision. Live by it. And they do until this day. They, they live by that uh, law of, of circumcision that God placed upon them in the Abrahamic covenant. With the case of Moses, uh, the, the symbol of covenant there was the Ten Commandments that were on pieces of stone. God wrote two of those with his finger, with his hand. The last one was put in the little chest in the Holy of Holies. And there in the golden chest that they took everywhere they went until they had a temple and then they placed it in the Holy of Holies. There it was as a permanent reminder that God said, we have a covenant. Our covenant is the law that I'm giving you. And uh, as long as you keep that law, our covenant remains. If you break that law, I am released from my covenant, and then you will not be under my blessing. Uh, you will be under a negative situation as long as you live, uh, which can be curses and sorrows and sadness and, 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 and many awful things. So God's covenant uh, with Moses uh, was the giving of him to him of the law. And th this was his, his, uh, his symbol of divine covenant, that he could say, here it is. This is what God wants us to live by. God wrote this with his own finger. And it is in the Holy of Holies, uh, installed there in this little box underneath the golden cherubim. Uh, there it rests. In the New Testament, where we have the, the, the new covenant, the last covenant, uh, here we have the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as our symbol of covenant that the Lord Jesus gave his life. He died that we all might live, that we all might have eternal life. He gave himself and uh, his blood is our symbol that we live under. The covenant of grace is the covenant of the blood of Jesus. It's very interesting uh, that when he gave the Holy Communion, he gave them a piece of bread and he said, I am the bread of life. And he says, this is my body that was broken for you. Now, his bones were not broken. Uh, only his flesh was broken by the stripes that were placed upon his back. And Isaiah said that by those stripes, we are healed. And so, therefore, when we move into the, into the covenant of grace, into the covenant of the New Testament, in the covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the emblems of that covenant is his body and his blood. And he... And, and when we have the Holy Communion, we, we are bringing together our covenant. It's very important, you see. We're bringing together the emblems of our covenant between God and us. And as we partake of the Holy Communion, uh, we are eating and drinking of a covenant that God has made with us. That as long as we are receiving the covenant and living by the laws of the covenant, then God says, these blessings belong to you. That's the reason I've been well for 50 years living under the covenant. And, and, and divine health is a little better than divine healing, a little less tormenting. God makes covenants with men of various spiritual strengths. No man is identical. God has never made a covenant with two persons, different persons, uh, that was identical covenant, number one, or that they were identical in their relationships with God. For example, uh, when God made a covenant with Adam, <laughs> he had created Adam with his own fingertips, you know? He had breathed into him and saw the heartbeat. He saw the first human heartbeat. He was looking upon it. And so the covenant that he made with Adam could not be related to anyone else. 
uh, you know, uh, for the simple reason that this was his first covenant that he'd ever made, and he made it with a person that he created out of the dust of the earth with his own hands. And, and so it was a different kind of covenant that could ever be made. And the covenant God makes with you will be different than he makes with any other person that's ever lived. The promises you make God will be different than anybody else has ever made with God. And the way God keeps those promises with you. And after many years of living under a covenant, I can tell you God is a good God. And that he is a keeper of his covenants. And if you will live as you promise to live, and don't forget it. You see, I have a commitment to God that I'll die poor. And you know, sometimes that's hard. People just give you too much, you know. You, 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 you say, oh, I just got to keep giving this stuff away because I have told God that if I were to die rich, I would die a traitor. I told God that. Now, now some ministers feel it's real nice for a minister to become wealthy, and they brag about it as if that's God's blessing upon them. Uh, it may not be. It may be the devil's curse. It may be the thing that, draw, that draws you away from God. But my special covenants that I have made with God uh, tell me that I have to live like you live. I have to live like the ordinary people in my congregation live. That I am not high and mighty. I am a boy raised up from death's door with a message to the world that I've got to give under certain circumstances. And, and so uh, I have to live with it. Now, God doesn't have you living my covenant. You don't say, well, I've got to live like Brother Sumrall. No, you don't. You have to live like God tells you to live. And, and when you do, uh, then you'll be living under your covenant with God. But with Adam, he, he made a special covenant with him in Eden and, and, and told him who he was and what he was to be and what would happen to him if he didn't do it. And he knew it beforehand. He knew that when he did a certain thing, he would die. God told him so. Uh, he didn't know what die meant because nobody died yet. But he soon found out. Now, when, when God made a covenant with Noah, it was a, a, a different type of covenant that he made. It was almost like the one he made with, with Adam, only we would accept Noah possibly as a stronger man than Adam. Because for 120 years, he built that ark. For 120 years, he was spit at. He was cursed. He was laughed at. He was mocked. Hey, you can't be laughed at for 120 years and not be strong and still show your face in public, you know. And so there was, there was physical, powerful strength. So in God dealing with Noah, he didn't deal with him the same as he did Adam, but uh, the, the, the two together are the only two that God started off with all over again, you see. He started off with Adam, then he started off with Noah. There was only Noah and his family to start with in, in the covenant that he made with Noah. But their, their covenants were different, as we will be studying. And then when you read uh, through the Word of God, you find that uh, Moses had a very strong covenant with God and, uh, and walked with God and lived in those commandments of God that he wanted them to live in. And many others in the Word of God had their covenants made with God, both as a person, as a family, and as a nation. And, and God honored those covenants, and God blessed them in their covenants that they had made. And so, but no, no two of them are the same. No two of them have the same blessing. No two of them have the same adverse relationships to those that don't keep those covenants. Uh, you, you take with me, if I broke my covenant, I'd just die of tuberculosis, it'd be all. It would just come from nowhere and doctors wouldn't be able to heal it and they wouldn't understand why they couldn't heal it. It would be because of a spiritual relationship that I had broken and it had come as a result it had come as a result of a, of a broken relationship. Now, yours may have no relationship to that at all. If you're expecting God to run uh, a kind of a little Xerox show, you'll miss him. He doesn't Xerox you and you and you and you. Uh, every one of us is a person that God talks to and deals with. And on certain, on certain areas and certain levels that God deals with. And, and so uh, uh, let's deal with God in the way and keep whatever God tells us to keep, we keep it. And wherever God tells us to live, we live it. Now, in the Word of God, we found that men broke their covenants. Oftentimes, it took a generation. Uh, I, I have noticed it's very difficult to take anything from one generation to another. Uh, let, let's take, for example, liberty. 
the, the, the people in our country don't understand liberty. They, they don't understand freedom. There are people in our country that say, you know, I wish we had communism like Russia has. And they, they say that. And I would like to send them to Siberia and let them live there for the next 50 years and enjoy it, you know. I've already been there. I don't want any of it, you see. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't care for it. But there are people that desire things that they don't understand. And, and uh, it's irresponsible to be desiring them. God wants us to know truth and to know Him and to know power and to know covenants. Covenants are relationships. They are divine relationships. They are moral relationships. They are spiritual relationships. And, and when you break your relationship with God, uh, you fall into problems that you never would have otherwise. And the most remarkable example of that on the face of the earth it happens to be the people of Israel. That when God told them exactly, if you don't keep these laws, what's going to happen to you? It's happened. And dispersed to the far corners of the earth. Misunderstood by all the peoples on the face there. Nobody understands them. And yet, they remain a single people. They, they, they don't flow into other people's blood. You, you take the Irish people like, 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 like I am, they flow in anybody's blood. An Irishman don't care who he marries, you know. It don't bother him a bit. And, and, and so the first thing you know, you've got one-tenth Irish and God help you for the other nine, you know? Yeah, yeah. But, but the Jews don't do that. For these thousands of years, they have retained this identity that came to them by covenant, by, by God's divine. You know, people should believe in miracles. Amen. All they have to do is look at the nation of Israel. Uh, when we lived there with our family, we discovered that the people that live there now we're not like the Jewish person you might have met in a store. They're very different kind of people. That from 102 nations of the world, they had brought them. They had brought them up out of the Arabian desert. They had never seen any civilization before. They had never seen any. They, they, they were a thousand years behind the time. And yet they brought them from Germany that were the very finest of surgeons, the very, very finest of, of, of lawyers, the very finest of actors. They, they were at the top of the arts. And yet they brought them from other lands that all they knew was how to follow a camel or an ass down, down the little furrow making, making, making some corn or, or planting something. And so, and then he brought those 102 nationalities together and made one out of them. They are one and strong and vigorous right now. Anybody that didn't believe in the covenants of God need to read the Bible. God said he would do that. God's keeping his part of the covenant. And so uh, it's good to have covenants with God. And it's good to understand. You, you will never understand God until you understand the covenants of God. You'll never have a true comprehension of God until you know the covenants he's made with man and how he keeps those covenants and how he desires covenants with you and me. And when you come to that, uh, you come into a, a magnificent knowledge of our God who created us. You say, but, uh, if a person breaks a covenant, is there any forgiveness for him? Yes. There are many people who return to their covenants. I, I, uh, I can't help but remember in, in Genesis 35 where God spoke to Jacob and said, Arise, go back to Bethel and stay there. And he turned and told his family, Did you know they already had idols? <laughs> they had pagan idols. He said, Put those idols. He, he buried them underneath a tree. He got rid of the idols. Then he said, wash your clothes and your bodies. We're going up to worship God. You see, what, what was he going for? He was going to the place where he had made a covenant with God. He said, I'll pay thee all my tithes. He was going to the place where he had his first divine revelation of God. He saw the angels of heaven walking up and down a ladder. He was going back to the place where he had made his consecration. He had been wild and woolly. He had deceived everybody he met. He did all the things that were bad. And he was going back to a new relation. He was going to keep his covenant now. He was going to return to his covenant now, you see. One, a nation can, a family can, or a person can return to a covenant that they've broken and God will receive them. One of the most remarkable of these in revealing God's side of it is the book of Hosea. Uh, Hosea is a very sad book. He was a preacher, a young preacher, an un unmarried preacher. 
And God said, I want you to live before Israel, the condition of Israel. I sure hate to have to live the mess this country's in today. I, I'd sure hate to have my family live in the mess this country. But God made him do it. He says, take a wife of the whores. So go down the red light district and get your woman. That's just kind of the wrong place to pick a wife, you know. But he, he obeyed. He went and got this woman. And after he got Gomer, uh, he, he found out by the names of the children. He called one of them unloved. He called one of them no kin of mine. And finally, she ran off with one of these lovers. And he put her on the block and sold her. <laughs> and sold her. You know, you run off with somebody and wish you were back. You know, he, he put it up for sale. And you know who bought her? The preacher, uh, Hosea. He went and, and gave all he had, gave all the wheat and all the barley he had in the barn, gave everything he had and bought her back. When she left, she was beautifully oiled, shining pretty. She was beautifully groomed because he had taken good care of her. When he bought her back off the slave block, dirty, filthy, ragged. And when he reached up to get her, all the town people talked. Look at that preacher. Gone for that harlot again, you know. But when he put his arm around her to shield her, and they walked down the little road to their house, she said, how are the children? He said, they're fine. She says, did you take me back because of the children? And he said, no. He says, did you take me back because of all these people that are laughing at you because your woman ran off and left you? He said, no. He says, well, why did you take me back? He said, because I love you. And there you have one of the greatest pictures of God receiving back those that break their covenants. She had made a covenant. She had broken it. And the great one, the prophet went and repurchased her, bought her again. And so God is a forgiver. And don't ever forget that God is a forgiver. And God does forgive. He wants to forgive. And so we have an amazing symbol shown us in the book of Hosea. Read it. And uh, of showing how he took back a woman that was unclean and made her clean again by living in his home with him as a proper mother and a proper wife. Also in the book of Isaiah chapter 37, verse 35, you have what God has as love for a rebellious people, backslidden people who go away from him, of how he will return and bless them, succor them, help them, keep them. And not only with them, but for, for you. I have known of many people in my time that had made covenants with God. They completely broke them in disaster. And God picked up the pieces. And God put them back together again. And the covenant was retained. And God blessed that person again. Sometime a backslider is the best Christian. They know both sides of the fence. <laughs> they, they, they have knowledge that a person that's never backslidden doesn't know. They know what it means for God to re-forgive, uh, to forgive again, uh, to, to forget the backslidings and say, we'll start over again. And so a backslider sometimes is the very finest of Christians. Man tends to forget God and his covenant and therefore become sinful again. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's in Genesis 6 and 5. And that is where, uh, when God sees a thing like that, uh, you're coming very close at that point uh, to the making of, of another covenant. Now, in our lessons that are coming up, we're going to deal with the Edenic covenant, covenant that was made in Eden. We're going to deal then with the Adamic covenant, a covenant that was made with Adam. And what we're going to show you very strongly is that uh, from the, the covenant that he made with Adam to the covenant he made with Noah, 2,000 years. Uh, God just doesn't make these things every day, you know. They're very solemn in God's sight. And, and that uh, there was 2,000 years there. 
And then when you go from the Noahic covenant, your next one is Abraham. And that's that 10 generations we were talking about. 10 generations. And, and so don't play with God and don't think God's going to mess with you every morning. Uh, God is very serious about what he's doing. And America needs to know that. And our generation needs to know that. That when God makes a covenant, he, he means for us to keep it. And don't think you're going to get another one the next day. If you just throw away that one, uh, you will find that that is, is not true. And, and from Abraham, we skip clear to Moses. Hundreds and hundreds of years, including 400 years of bondage before we get around uh, to another one. And, and then there are several in that area, but then you skip clear to David for a, for a major, for another major, you see. Hundreds and hundreds of years again. And you know, when you get uh, to David and you go through some that were made uh, in, that, in that point of time, you're actually jumping from David right straight into the New Testament. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? A thousand years again. So uh, when we are speaking of these covenants, we don't want to have a feeling within us that they're just slight things or easy things or my covenant with God is the biggest thing I've ever done in my life. And the most important aspect of my life right now is to live up to the covenant I've made with God until I die. So that reveals to us the importance of making a covenant and of keeping a covenant. And uh, the spectacle before the world today, of course, is the nation of Israel. They, they are the people that splash their covenant against the wall. And uh, the whole world can see them. They're in bondage in Russia today. They, they, they can't get out. They'd like to get out. There are other places in the world where they are still persecuted today. And the, the whole impact of it is they didn't keep the covenant they made with God. And, and so uh, whenever you make a good relationship with God, uh, you better write it down and, and keep it. Because if you do, God will bless you and your life will be a good life. And of course, the general covenants that we live under spiritually, let's live them.